this will feel a little weird. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the Matrix. Free your mind. Whoa. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained and is voted for by you guys in last week's poll. Today, we're going to be exploring The Matrix. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room, it is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Between Elon Musk's exclamations that we're living in a simulation and the many centuries of religion and culture, which suggests that there's more to the world than it seems, it's fair to say that many of us have considered that maybe, just maybe, this world around us is a simulation. With the fourth installment of the Matrix franchise just around the corner, and as Lana Wachowski has said, the themes being more relevant now than ever before, 2021 seems like the perfect time to plug yourself back in. Brimming with references to Plato, Baudrillard, and tackling notions of free will and determinism, The Matrix is a fascinating sci-fi blockbuster that flip-flops between the computer program known as The Matrix and the grim reality of the future. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. In the real world, the year is sometime around 2199. At some point, humanity developed super-intelligent machines that took over, and humanity now occupies a sunless, mechanized wasteland, where the vast majority of human beings are being harvested for energy in endless fields. Kept in isolated pods where they're literally fed the remains of the dead, their only salvation is the fact that most of them are unaware of their situation, distracted by a simulated dream world known as the Matrix. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. On the surface, The Matrix is a film about a man, Neo, aka Mr. Anderson, prophesied to be the one to save humanity from the scourge of machines, coming to terms with the fact that he is indeed the chosen one. But as its ever-present place in popular culture will inform you, there's far more to it than that. As we've discussed, The Matrix is a construct created by machines to simulate human life in 1999. Thus, it's a computer program that emulates the reality humans expect. They're born, go to work, eat, smell, laugh, fall in love, and die. But none of it is real. The reality is far bleaker, with machines growing human babies in farms and then plugging them into the Matrix, while their bodies are used as bio-batteries to power the machines themselves. The film starts within the Matrix, with our protagonist known under two guises, the office worker Thomas A. Anderson, and the hacker Neo being goaded by his computer to follow the white rabbit, which appears as a tattoo on a woman's arm who arrives at his door. He follows it, finding Trinity, and it becomes clear that Neo has, for a long time, been believing that there's far more to life than the world he's living in. Indeed, there is far more than the simulation, and when Neo finally meets Trinity's superior, Morpheus, he's given a choice to take the red pill and discover the truth, or take the blue pill and return to the comfort of the false reality that is the Matrix. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Neo swallows the red pill, which acts as a tracer, allowing Morpheus and his crew to locate Neo's body amid the battery farms in the real world. And in a gruesome moment of birth, Neo is released from the simulation and sees the world as it truly is, before being picked up by Morpheus and his crew. Welcome to the real world. Am I dead? Far from it. After being swept up in the Nebuchadnezzar, Neo's mind is enhanced by computer programs teaching him how to fight and embrace that he can bend the Matrix's programming rules. And as he trains, Morpheus explains the world to him. Everything from the Matrix being a simulation, machines harvesting humans to the point that there's only one human stronghold left called Zion, to the prophecy that he is the one. 
You are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. While its theme may initially be brain melting, The Matrix's presentation of the simulation hypothesis is quite simple. Humans are physically plugged into a mainframe, which runs a simulation in their mind, and when they're unplugged, they return to the real world. In other words, the divide between simulation and reality is eminently clear within the narrative of the film. Thus, in this binary sense of reality versus simulation, The Matrix points to the foundational idea of Plato's cave. In his work Republic, this allegory presented by Plato centers on a group of people who live chained up in a cave, only ever seeing one wall. On that wall, they see shadows of objects that pass by, leading them to believe that these shadows are what reality is. Only after they're freed from the cave and get to see the real world can they understand that reality is not what they once thought. Plato's cave is fundamental to the Matrix's version of the simulation hypothesis, as it works in binary. The shadows on the wall aren't reality, and 3D reality is similar to how the Matrix is an image of a false reality, while the world of 2199 is real. The allegory of the cave goes a step deeper. As a thought experiment, it questions if we can ever know that what we're looking at is reality. This directly ties in with one of the film's key influences, French philosopher Jean Baudrillard, particularly his 1981 paper Simulacra and Simulation, which was mandatory reading for everyone involved in the production of The Matrix. Early in the movie, we see Jean's book Simulacra and Simulation on screen, which dives into a version of the simulation hypothesis in postmodernism. The phrase the desert of the real, which Morpheus uses to describe the wasteland of the real world, also comes from Baudrillard. The philosopher was even asked to work on the later Matrix films, but declined the offer, for a reason we'll get onto in a minute. Baudrillard's simulation hypothesis is far more complex than Plato's cave. Instead of platonic binaries, Baudrillard argues that the line between simulation and reality is one that is relatively unknowable, as if one reality is false, what is there stopping the next reality from also being simulation? Jean noted, Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper-real. We can see this argument in full force through two moments. When Cypher is talking with Agent Smith, he eats a steak, acknowledging that both the steak and his experience of it are false, exclaiming that without that knowledge, he could just enjoy it. Ignorance is bliss. Interestingly, Mouse makes a remarkably similar statement in the real world, arguing that to deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human. But if we look at these statements, they're essentially the same. They both discuss giving in to human pleasures, but these human pleasures can as easily be created by a machine as they can by reality itself. So how can we know which is real? Well, we can't. This is the simulation hypothesis that Baudrillard commits to, where reality and simulation are so indistinguishable that it's totally unknowable which side of the line we're on. In fact, it's this very discrepancy that caused Baudrillard to turn down working on The Matrix, as although his theories inspired the film's premise, the film doesn't really do much to go beyond the questions he posed. Instead, offering a simplified explanation that doesn't take the complexities of the postmodern world into consideration. Once the notion that Neo has lived his entire life in a simulation, and the reality of humanity's dire circumstances are explained to him, the whole crew heads off to The Matrix to check whether the Oracle believes Neo is the one. You got the gift. But it looks like you're waiting for something. She exclaims that he isn't, yet Morpheus and the others will hear none of it. While they're inside, everything goes south. We the audience are shown that Cypher had agreed to give up Morpheus, provided he could be plugged back in, and the team are surrounded by SWAT teams and agents. Morpheus gives himself up to the agents, buying Neo and Trinity time to get to a phone and leave the Matrix, while Cypher gets unplugged, kills Dosa, Apoc, and Switch, but fortunately gets swatted by Tank before he can kill the One. Neo, determined to save Morpheus, goes back in, kits up and blasts him out of the custody of the agents, and after many dodge bullets, super fast punches, insane jumps, a helicopter explosion, and a sentinel attack on the Nebuchadnezzar, Neo is shot by Agent Smith just as he's about to unplug. Fortunately, he's beginning to believe. Revealing Neo's true power to conceive the Matrix as a complete construct, allowing him to transcend the division between both realities and break the rules of the Matrix in spectacular fashion. Not only does he effectively break the will of the most powerful programs within the Matrix, but he also seemingly destroys Agent Smith, and comes out on the other end realizing his true potential by fulfilling the prophecy of the One, raising questions about determinism and free will. And don't worry about the vase. Let's 
really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? Within the Matrix's narrative and interpretation of the simulation hypothesis, there's a recurrent question of free will. At the very beginning of the film, Neo receives a message on his computer reading knock knock just before a knock comes at the door. The Oracle correctly predicts that Neo will knock over a vase, and the glaring determinist prophecy that Neo is the one all point firmly towards our characters lacking any free will. But at the same time, Neo adamantly refutes the idea of fate, exclaiming, I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. While the Oracle also explains that Neo isn't the one when, well, he is. This divide between determinism and free will is one which spans the entire franchise, with the later films discussing how societal human structures enact their own type of determinism. In one notable conversation, Neo talks with Counselor Harmon about how the machines which control Zion's air and water supplies are controlled by the humans, but because the fact that their failure or switching off would spell the death of all humanity, the humans are simultaneously controlled by the machines, spelling a codependent determinist loop. I like to be reminded this city survives because of these machines. Sometimes I think about all those people still plugged into the Matrix, and when I look at these machines, uh, I can't help thinking that in a way, we are plugged into them. In many ways, the Matrix can be seen as the human inability to accept determinism. Neo, our protagonist and mouthpiece in the world, rejects the idea wholeheartedly, but throughout his rejection, he witnesses determinism incarnate, the knock, the vase, and the fulfilling of the prophecy that he is, in fact, the one. In fact, in The Matrix Reloaded, it turns out that the prophecy of Neo being the one is one which has played out five times in the past, each time being a projected, predictable result to The Matrix itself. What makes this wild for me is that Baudrillard literally said, The Matrix is surely the kind of film about The Matrix that The Matrix would have been able to produce, and in the grand scheme of the film franchise, he was right. But beyond an answer to whether determinism is true or not, the real intrigue of the film's determinism is posited by the Oracle herself. After Neo breaks the vase, as foretold, she poses the question of whether Neo would have still broken the vase if she hadn't foretold the event. Again, we can use this as a point to extrapolate. Neo was told by the Oracle that he wasn't the one, but then he became the one. So if the Oracle had acted differently, would he still have become the one? With questions like this, the Matrix ties itself to determinist ambivalence, begging us to ask ourselves these questions about simulation, reality, determinism, and free will. And while it simulates these arguments in a sci-fi setting, it never reaches out into our real world to suggest that we are living in a simulation, or not. But this very thought brings us right back to Baudrillard and the question of how we could ever know. How could we know if this was a simulation without waking up? How could we know whether our actions are predetermined or done through free will? While modern philosophy, science and culture all struggle with these seemingly unanswerable questions, we can turn them back onto ourselves, asking simply, does any of it matter? If we were ripped from the Matrix today, as Baudrillard suggests, how would we be able to know whether the so-called reality we emerged into wasn't simply another simulation? As we tumble down this and the many questions that follow, we're left with the incredible nihilism which pushes us back towards by far the film's most hated character, Cypher. I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, the Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realized? Ignorance is bliss. Despite the fact that Cypher says that ignorance is bliss for different reasons, perhaps he was onto something. As if the only thing we know is that we cannot know. Perhaps it's better not to know.